My name is Clea Kopp. I'm a forensic anthropologist. Forensic anthropologists in general deal with the identification of unidentified human remains. We normally work with the police, but I've mostly been involved in the investigation of war crimes, working on behalf of the United Nations. I have a particular interest area in the relationship between missing persons and unidentified bodies. And in the process of working in this field and running a non-profit that was focused on trying to form anti-mortem profiles of missing persons that are distinct from missing persons reports, I ended up writing a mystery novel about that process. So I've had the enjoyment and the challenge of trying to work forensic science into fiction and also, I suppose, have developed maybe a deeper appreciation of, of how popular television shows and, and print are tackling these issues. I obviously, coming, I'm coming at it as a scientist, there are particular sort of agendas in my mystery novel, but it's meant to be just as enjoyable a read as, as anything else that's out. Favorite mystery writers really focus on police procedure, and I, and I like it. There's a lot of television uh, fictional police procedures that I like. I must say that I'm, I don't watch CSI and Bones in general, but um, I'm a big fan of Luther, which is, of course, a British TV show. I, I've always been a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes in print, but I really like the new television version of Sherlock Holmes that's, that's on television in, in England. Now. Hi, I'm Hayley. I'm a forensic scientist for the Metropolitan Police. Hi, I'm Val McDermott, and I write crime fiction and thrillers, which is quite heavily dependent on the kind of things you do professionally. <laughs> it's very, very nice to meet you. I'm a big fan. So. Thank you. Thank you. I generally find, you know, when I'm researching my books, that the, the way to go is to talk to people who know about what they're doing. So I would go to somebody like you with a, a specific question about maybe an idea that I'd had, and the ideas can be picked up from maybe listening to something on the radio or reading something in a newspaper or whatever. And then what I want to do is have a conversation with you. To as, see as, if it's feasible. Partly to see if it's feasible, but also because I know that in the course of that conversation, what you'll tell me is the things I didn't know to ask you. So I'll ask you about one thing and we'll talk about it and we'll talk around it and you, what you'll give me is the little anecdotes. Uh, you'll maybe tell me, this thing, this strange thing happened to my colleague yeah. or this really weird thing happened to me or this very funny thing happened to somebody I know. And those are the details that make it feel authentic for, for me, for the reader's point of view. Um, but but you of course are looking. For, you're not looking for anecdotage when you're doing your stuff. You're looking for hard yeah, detail, aren't you? Yeah, it's all factual. Um, the narrative sort of gets taken out of it um, very early on from our stage. Um, when you first go to a crime scene, you'll be given the case circumstances, um, so what they think has happened. Um, but and that guides your investigation to a certain point of view, um, gives you an indication of what you're looking for, but as soon as you step in, you have to sort of leave that behind and look at what's physically there, the physical evidence. Because if you're too guided by what somebody has told you might be there, then you might not be looking in the, in the right place. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so how often in practice does the narrative change once you actually start exploring the crime scene? All the time, all the time. When the first call comes in, um, it, can, it can be completely different. Um, I once had a text message that said, um, crime scene, there's a head in a bag behind Buckingham Palace. Um, obviously that never happened because I'm sure everyone would have heard about it in the papers. Um, but that story sort of evolved and changed and then the, the true um, circumstances came out and it was nothing like that at all. But it's just at the very, very, very early stages of an investigation, it's all very rapid response um, and when you get there, uh, then you get the full story from you know, the horse's mouth. Um, and from that story, you can then go in and create your strategy. But I was going to ask you, do you, ever, do you always sort of stick to what's factual? And um, do you ever go, well, that may not be possible, but that really makes a good story. Let's write it in and get into the realms of fiction. I try to, but the technology is concerned, I try to stay within the realms of, of either what's possible now or what a scientist says to me. We can't do this now, but we're going to be able to do it in a year or two. This is where we're headed with this. So, for example, some years ago now, I wrote a book called Killing the Shadows, and it was about geographic profiling. 
at that time geographic profiling wasn't being used in the field but it, yeah. but it was being yeah. beta tested by the guys, the company belonging to the guy who told me all about it and had taken me through all the stuff he was doing. So I wrote a book that had in it science that wasn't factual science yet but it, but it was going to be and it was quite funny because a couple of years back I was in America when they were doing those um, those two random snipers that were going around America, okay, yeah. and I switched on the TV one morning, watched the TV news, and there's my guy standing there talking to the talking to the camera about how they're using his program to try and track down these oh, these snipers. Brilliant. So I kind of felt. Like I actually used it in the book. Yeah, well, it was nice to be ahead of the curve, you know.